Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Okay, a few smiles. Before I give my message, um, Thursday night the board met and we have nominated, selected people to be on the pastoral search committee. We need to see who's willing to serve on that committee before we announce it. We more than likely will announce who's on that next week. But there's something we need from you. And something was sent out in the e email this week about a uh, member recommendation form. Please fill that out, if you, and there are some available in the foyer. There's another form called the Pastoral Search Committee Survey. We originally thought that that was for the Pastoral Search Committee to fill out, but it isn't. You need to get both of these forms and fill both of them out and turn them in. This is your opportunity to have input into the selection of a, of a new pastor. So please, take it seriously. Please join in, be part of the process, and I'm sure God will bless us as we move forward. I would invite all of you to pray, pray daily as we go through this process. May God's grace and peace be yours individually and together because of the fact that God is our Father, Jesus is our elder brother, and the Holy Spirit is our comforter. Amen. Before I begin, just sing the chorus. There's no special music today, so you are the special music. Let's just sing that very familiar chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I have two confessions to make. The first one is that I chose this passage of scripture, Isaiah 43, because I was focusing on verse 18 where Isaiah wrote that God says, I will make all things new. I, I chose it because I thought it would be a good New Year's text, not just to say we're going to have a bunch of New Year's resolutions. I think the happiest people at New Year's time are the gyms because everybody makes New Year's resolutions to attend and a vast number of them start out strong but finish weak, no pun intended. I chose it because, as a church, we need a new start. I chose it because I think we need to move forward. But as I spent time in the passage, I began to see something else. And so that's my second confession. I have always understood this passage as primarily referring to us personally. And we can use it that way, and we should. But that's not its primary purpose. I have used it when people are in crisis and use it as part of a prayer for them because it talks about when you go through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the flood, it won't overwhelm you. I've used it at anointing services, and I will continue to do that because that is appropriate. But today, I want to focus on not the personal application, although that is implied. Today, I want to focus on the primary application, the primary application, because this is a message for God's people collectively. He starts out, and open your Bibles or your devices, because I'm going to be pointing out verses they are not going to be on the screen, but, but verse 43, it starts out by saying, now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel. And while individuals make up God's people, he's addressing God's people together in this passage. But before we get into what he's saying to them, we need to understand the context of this 43rd and 44th chapter. I've actually included part of 44. 
In Isaiah 1 through 39, Isaiah is writing to the current situation he's in, the current situation Israel's in. He's writing about their sins of of idolatry. He's writing about their sins of, of selfishness, which they are more concerned that they have material things than they are about the widow and the orphan. He's writing about their, the fact that they have decided in their idolatry that they're going to set up what they're going to believe and what they're going to follow and not let God do that. That's a common human trait, is it not? And so he's writing and he's giving judgments against the, the enemies of God's people that God will pour judgments upon them. And he tells them that he will also pour judgments upon Jerusalem and he announces that there will come enemies of Babylon to take them captive. And then in verse chapters 40 to 66, there's, there's a transition that takes place. He still mentions their sins. He still gives warning. But he starts about by giving a message of hope. The message of hope grows stronger and stronger throughout the, the rest of the book until it comes to Isaiah 52 and 53, the message of a common Messiah. And yes, in chapter 9 of, of the first section, he announced that there would come a Messiah who would be born of a virgin. The hope that Israel had. He, he, and so he, he begins by putting out that hope that they would have in the Messiah coming and ending in chapter 66 with a depiction of, of the final hope, the hope of heaven. And so he's writing to people with great needs, people who have been caught up in sin, slavery to sin, idolatry, misusing other people. And in chapter 42, we discover what those sins are. He talks about idolatry going to other gods to ask other gods to bless instead of asking Jehovah God to bless. Following their ways of worship instead of his way of wor- God's way of worship. Talks about selfishness of the heart that's more concerned about material gain than spiritual gain. About taking care of myself before I look to help others. In chapter 42, he talks about the Israelites being blind and deaf. They're blind to where God is working. They're deaf in terms of not hearing what God is telling them. They want God to just okay what they already think and do. And of course, we don't have that problem, do we? There should be at least one smile out there somewhere. He goes on and he talks about the fact that they... There's sinful rebellion against God and his law and his ways going on. And he talks about the fact that because of this, they will experience spiritual poverty. And not just spiritual poverty, but they will be taken captive and they will experience the spiritual loss. They'll experience material loss. They will lose their freedom. Not because God has abandoned them, but because they had abandoned God. And so with all that in mind, you would expect that after chapter 42, listing all these sins, that what God would say next was, I want nothing to do with you, thank you. He doesn't do that. Aren't you glad? Instead, he gives a message of hope. And what's interesting in chapter 43, woven in throughout this chapter, and of course it wasn't written with a chapter, but the chapter we have before us, woven throughout this chapter, there are things where God gives hope, but he also reminds them he's well aware of their tendency to backslide and to reject him. And so there's warnings against doing that at the same time while he's giving a message of hope. Once again, aren't you glad that God is a God of mercy and compassion and a God of hope? And so the first thing we notice, and I'm not going to look at every verse, but the first thing we notice is that God is telling us in this chapter that he is the hope of his people. Did did you catch the significance of that? I'm going to have to ask Nicholas to come up and get some amens going. God is the hope of his people. We are not God's hope. He is our hope. 
And, and, and it says that in the very first verse. Notice he said, now, now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob. That's interesting, he uses the name Jacob because Jacob was the beginning of the creation Abraham started of God's people, but it went on to Jacob. But, but that word created there means to someone who made something happen that wasn't happening before. He created you as a people, Jacob. And Jacob meant the supplanter. He says, I'm, I'm making a people out of someone who was a deceiver and the a, and a supplanter. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes I think we think God only honors the church and his people when they have their act together. I, I, I also want to point out that he then says, he, he is the one who formed you, O Israel. Remember, Jacob's name was changed from the supplanter to Israel, he who strives with God. He who wrestles with God. He who tries to seek and find out what God has in store for him or her. And so he says, the one who formed you, and that's not the word for create, that's the word for a potter forming the clay for a certain purpose that the potter has in mind, not that the pot has in mind. Notice the imagery of that, those words. It's the word, idea of God saying, I'm making you my people, but I'm going to form and fashion you to be the people I want you to be. I, I want you to notice what else he says about Israel. He says, I have called you by your name. Remember, in the Bible, name often means character. I have called you to be the people I want you to be. I've chosen you. And notice the next phrase. He says, in verse, uh, the last part of verse 1, I have called you by your name. You are who, what? Mine. You belong to me. I belong to you. He created us. He called us. He, 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 he says we belong to him. Why? Because later on, notice what it says in, uh, it says later on, he says, you are precious to me. You're precious to me. Precious? Wait a minute. He, he just says that we're people who followed idolatry and selfishness. We're blind and deaf. We're sinful, rebellious, and we're spiritually poor. And God says you're precious anyway. Wow. Not only are we precious, but he says he's going to honor us because he loves us. His unconditional love. And throughout this chapter then, God is the hope of, of his people because of who he is. I want you to notice, and I'm not going to point to verses, you can read it later if you haven't read it already, but I want you to notice some of the names God uses in this passage. He says, I am the Lord. I'm the master. I, I'm the one you're to serve. He says, I am the holy one. Everything I do is righteous and perfect. He says, I am your savior. We often think of Jesus as savior, but the Bible is clear that God is our savior as well. He didn't die on the cross, but he sent his son. The plan of salvation is God's plan, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is our Savior. He's the Redeemer, the one who purchases us back from slavery. He is the Creator. He is the Rock, and he is the King. As you think about God as our hope, God as his people's hope, he is our hope because of all of those things he is. But he's also our hope for the deeds he has done. I, I want you to look at verse 2 with me. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. Isaiah is referring back to part of Israel's history. Passing through the waters took place where? At the Red Sea. Passing through the rivers took place where? At the Jordan. 
He's reminding them of how he, God, was able to take them out of Egypt and out of slavery to the promised land. And he says, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Remember the story of the fiery serpents that were there all along, but God had been protecting Israel during that time in the wilderness. Nor shall the flame scorch you. God had his cloud by day to protect them from the scorching heat. And so God is reminding them he's the God of hope. He's the same God who had saved them in the past. And that same God longs to act for them in the present. Act for them in the present. But there's something else about this passage. God gives some commands in this passage. The first command is simple, fear not. Fear not. There are those who studied phrases in the Bible, and this is one of, if not the most numerous phrase throughout the entire Bible, fear not. Fear not. Jesus told his disciples numerous times, fear not. Why do we fear not? Notice, first one, God has redeemed us. Fear not, for I have redeemed you, verse 1 says. We don't have to be quaking in our boots, wondering if he's able to save. I want you to notice what verse um, 5 says. Fear not, for I am what? With you. I'm present. I'm by your side. I'm walking the journey with you. In chapter 44, verse 2, there's another fear not. It says, thus the Lord who made you informed you from the womb, who will help you? Fear not, for I have chosen you. Fear not, you're special. Then there is 44, verse 8. And in verse 80, he says, Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? No. Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. That imagery of a rock is, is about firmness and steadfastness. It's about the faithfulness of God. God says, You don't need to fear because I am faithful to you even at times when you are faithless to me. Fear not. We have nothing to fear for the future except we forget how God has been with us in the past. And then the second command. Remember not the former things, verses 18 and 19. I want to look at that with you for a few moments. Isaiah says, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Wait, wait a minute. What former things are we supposed to forget? I think the first former thing we're supposed to forget is the sins that God has already forgiven us. Isn't it true that most of the time we have a harder time forgiving ourselves than we do forgiving other people? We have a hard time dealing with our own failures. I, I think it's, it's, it's really important to notice that in verse 25, he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more. Think about that. God says, I'm blotting out your sins for, my, for his own sake. Not, we need our sins forgiven, of course. But God has put himself with you. And what hurts you hurts him, Isaiah 63 says. Those of you who are parents, you know full well that when your kids are hurting and when they fail you hurt along with them right remember not the form of the things remember not your sins someone has once said that too many Christians are involved in deep sea fishing God says he's going to cast our sins into the depths of the sea and we go and we fish them back out and unfortunately, we don't always do that just for ourselves. We do it for other people as well. Deep sea fishing is not a sport Christians should be 
uh, taking part in. You can go out and fish on the boat, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. We're not to remember the former things. Wait a minute. Isaiah has already mentioned the former things. He's mentioned the Exodus. He's mentioned God taking them through the, the Red Sea and through the Jordan. He's mentioned him protecting them in the desert. What do you mean we're not supposed to remember the former things? I think what he's saying is not that we don't recall what he's done, but we don't rely on him doing it the same way every single time. When Israel is coming back from captivity in Babylon, they're not led by the Shekinah glory, and they're going a lot farther distance than the Israelites did in terms of miles. They're not going out in procession with as large a crowd as when they came out of of Egypt. They're not going out having been given all the jewelry and all the things that would take care of the trip like they did when they left Egypt. He did it differently. He did it differently. One commentary says that Isaiah issues an important reminder. While the past can teach and illustrate, it must not bind us. The Lord always has greater things in store. He has revealed in the past, but he is always more than the past revealed. He is present today. When you think about the wars in the Old Testament, which is all about proving who was God, I've said this before, God seldom did, had Israel go to war in the same way. Why? Because he knows that as human beings, we tend to trust in methods. It's easier to trust in methods than to trust in him. When Jesus performed the miracles, he seldom did miracles the same way. There is only two that were very similar. The feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000 and the calling of the disciples when they had that big cat, uh, catch of, of fish. Why? Because he knew that we would trust in methods instead of trusting in him. God says he's going to do new things in new ways. Not because he's changed, but sometimes because those around us have changed and sometimes we ourselves have changed. There's another command. It's found in verse 21. It says, this people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. They're going to praise me to other people. They're going to talk about me to other people. They're going to tell other people the kind of God I am so that other people can worship God too. And so God says, I will do a new thing, and I made a mistake in my sermon title. The scripture doesn't say God's going to do new things. He says he's going to do a new thing, singular. But out of that new thing will come other new things. What is the new thing he's going to do? And I, I didn't see this actually till yesterday. You have to read on in chapter 44 to discover the new things going, God's going to do. He reminds them of what he's already told them in verse 1. Hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, once again, and formed you, once again, who will help you. Fear not, I have chosen you. Now here comes the new thing, verses 3 to 5. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendant, and my blessing on your offspring. The new thing is that God will grow his people. Just as the desert is a place that should not grow anything, when he pours water on it, it sprouts, grass grows, flowers bloom. A, a few years ago, after the holy fire up in Orange County and, and in Riverside, it was right near my home, and there was a section, some of you may remember it, on the 15 freeway where the, the California poppies were in mass because of the ash and the nutrients and the water that came. You go by that now, I was by it just the other day, and it is nothing but brown because it hasn't been watered. What Isaiah is saying is, look, the new thing I'm going to do is I'm going to provide growth where it doesn't look like growth is going to take place. 
How is he going to do that? He says, I will pour out my spirit on your descendants. I think Isaiah was having a prophecy about Pentecost. But it's not just a prophecy about what took place at Pentecost. It's a prophecy about what takes place when we allow the spirit to fall upon us. I want you to notice what it says about it. He doesn't say, I'll give you my spirit. He doesn't say, I'll give you a little bit of my spirit. He says, I'm going to pour my spirit out on you. The new thing is that the spirit will do a work that we cannot do by ourselves. And the result of that will be, it says that my people will witness. They will say in verse 5, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand the Lord's and, the, and name himself by the name of the Lord. I want you to think about that bold statement. Do you know this morning that you are the Lord's? Do you know that we as the Laguna Seventh-day Adventist Church are the Lord's? Do we know that he is the one who is our help? Do we know that only by God's Spirit will we be able to fulfill the commission he's given us to reach out and declare his praise to our friends, to our family, to our work associates? We're so afraid of sharing what God has done for us that we're so afraid of offending people and yet God implores us to witness and to declare his praise we need to apply it to the Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church took a picture this morning it's the entrance to our church I, I took that picture because I I want it's not just about us arriving and coming. It's about us going out to be God's people, not just on Sabbath morning, but Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sabbath. It's not just about coming to worship God as a people. It's about worshiping God as a people every single day. And yes, Sabbath is special. But the purpose of worship is to declare his praise. The purpose of worship is to recognize as we move forward as a church family to recognize that while we have failed in some ways and while we individually and collectively have made, done sin, committed sins and made mistakes, God still sees us as precious. He says he's going to honor us because he loves us and that has not changed. We need to see the Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church as precious in God's eyes, as honored by him because of his great love for us. Paul put it this way in Romans, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans, he put it this way. What can separate us from the love of God? Death can't, life won't, and all the angels of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are in the, deep, in the highest heaven of the deepest earth, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is shown to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to see each other as precious, loved by God, honored by him. Yes, in spite of our failures, and we all have them. This morning, God is saying to us, as we look towards finding and seeking to find a pastor for this church, as we look towards finding ways to be his people in the Laguna Niguel City, or wherever you live, we need to remember that though, while that may be scary, he says, when you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. When you go through the floods, they will not overwhelm you. I will protect you. I will guide you. Because I've chosen you to be mine.